treat, trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat. If you don't, I don't care. Mischief hangs in the air. Take your gate, ruin your crops. Your fate for the winter lies in your plots. Trick or treating is really two historical rituals with lots of overlap reaching its current form through a game of cultural telephone, dressing up in costume, and giving out or receiving treats. We can't get into those without looking at the appropriation of the pagan and later Christian holidays associated with the harvest and the time of respecting the dead. The history of paying out treats to mischievous spirits goes all the way back to the Celtic origins of Halloween with Samhain. On the original Bonfire Night of the Druids, it was said that leaving out meat for evil spirits would lead them to pass by and not cause harm to your home. <gasps> the practice of guising, or dressing up in costume, dates back just as long. Hiding an animal skin was said to keep the spirits from knowing your true form. The passing out of treats is most commonly believed to be related to the tradition of souling in the British Isles where the children would sing songs for the recently deceased in exchange for dry spice cookies with a cross printed on them. Another name for the practice in other places has been mumming. The term trick-or-treating didn't come until 1927 when it was first mentioned in an Alberta newspaper. It was then popularized by Disney with the three ducks Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Guising shows up in various traditions, from carnivals and cold to Rio de Janeiro. Dressing up and pulling pranks, singing songs, and asking for money has been associated with many holidays, from Christmas and on Guy Fox night, and even in Thanksgiving in America. Sawin was said to be a time when the space between the material and spiritual worlds was more liminal, and that the spirits would have greater influence on the living. The thinning of the veils and the access to the spirit world has similarities with Walpurgisnacht in Germany, which also takes place on the eve of the pagan holiday of Beltane. An even more tenuous yet synchronistic connection to Dia de los Muertos in Mexico could be made. For the Celts and early Christians, by the 7th century there was still two holidays, one All Saints Day in March for the Christians, and the other Harvest Time or Samhain in October for the Druids. In 601 AD, Pope Gregory told missionaries to repurpose local holidays in order to convert people to Catholicism. History is hardly a straight line though. With the rise of Christianity and the movement to replace pagan holidays around Europe, we can see similarities between many of these traditions and present day trick-or-treating. So as all of these cultures and rituals made their way to the Americas, they got passed along and changed. Eventually, the dominant trait of this holiday became the mischief. Youths would steal gates from their hinges and stomp on flowers. On one especially bad year in 1933, during the Great Depression, a night known as the Black Halloween occurred. The vandalism increased to flipping over cars and cutting down telephone poles. The first real attempt to curb this vandalism happened in 1914 when a woman from Hiawatha, Kansas named Elizabeth Krebs turned her home into the place of the first Halloween party. At 512 Iowa Street was the first Halloween frolic. For a number of years, it was successful and a way for the community to reduce the rowdiness that generally accompanied Halloween, Mischief Night, and other fall festivals. But we'll cover that more in the next episode, when we talk about Halloween parties. During the Great Depression, having parties for the kids to keep them out of trouble became more prohibitive, and neighbors began to team up, sending the kids door to door looking for treats to spread the burden. Candy was already hard to come by with the increased scarcity during World War II. But it wasn't just scarcity. Candy companies had yet to capitalize on the holiday, focusing on other holidays such as Christmas and George Washington's birthday with candy cherries and chocolate logs. The most notorious of all the Halloween candies was originally known as chicken feed. It was a candy that was popular on the 4th of July and in Easter baskets where it was said that the marshmallow peeps would feed upon it. Being a simulation of corn, it is now known by that name, candy corn. 
My personal belief is that it was all made in the 1880s and has mostly been used as decoration ever since. It's been recycled and recirculated every Halloween since candy companies jumped on that sweet treat train. Among the popcorn balls, caramel apples, and other often homemade treats, prior to the soon-to-be-mentioned trick-or-treating scares, candy corn had already had the colors associated with the holiday, and the two have been wed ever since, despite many attempts by their makers to rebrand and add new flavors. Even this tradition had its ups and downs, though. In 1964, a New York woman thought a few too many older children were coming to her door, and she decided to pull a prank right back at them. She began to pass out steel wool and ant poison. The local media jumped on this, and the scares of trick-or-treating increased throughout the 70s. Poison and razor blades are everywhere! This was initially great for the candy companies, as it drove the sales of prepackaged candy. But even that was thrown off the rails when the Tylenol poisonings began in the 1980s. I do think they've recovered since, though. All the claims of poisoning by strangers or razor blades in the treats have been proven false. Even still, in 2022, $3.1 billion were spent on Halloween candy in the U.S. It's roughly 30% of the total amount spent on the holiday, which is second only to Christmas. Trick-or-treaters may have fun collecting candy, but the thrill of going door-to-door is amplified by the displays and decorations put out. $3.4 billion was spent on decorations in 2022, and increasingly start popping up in stores right after Independence Day. From the highly decorated personal haunts to the trunk-or-treating in church parking lots, spouts to drop candy through that popped up during the pandemic, or the malls inviting folks in to decrease traffic accidents, The locations of trick-or-treating have gone through changes based on community needs, which is really the story of how communities come together around the holiday. We've touched on guising, or dressing up, but why do we wear costumes and associate them with Halloween the way we do? Costumes are especially interesting from a sociological perspective. We can see what is scaring people, what is politically significant or acceptable, and what is considered attractive, humorous, or even just considered a costume. Bogey books were the most common early version of commercial Halloween costumes. Not even catalogs, the books were the items themselves. Full of homemade costume ideas, mostly consisting of paper mache masks, the goal was to hide oneself from those you were begging for candy for. The U.S. has always had an individualistic streak, and asking for handouts, even at Halloween, was definitely frowned upon. So hiding from, or even scaring those whose doors you were knocking on, was seen as the goal for early trick-or-treaters. The 1930s saw the beginning of the move away from trying to scare off the spirits and your treaters and enjoying dressing up as your favorite cartoon characters. Mickey and Minnie Mouse were especially popular. In the 1940s, a company called Ben Cooper changed Halloween for kids for decades to come. They were responsible for all of the hard plastic masks with no give and the string backs. They started with Snow White and grew from there. He-Man, Batman, Chewbacca all became accessible kids' costumes from then on. These styles have sprung up again throughout history, and you can see many of them at the pop-up Halloween stores even today. Through the 60s and 70s, adults took up the mantle of costuming, which we will cover more in the Halloween Party segment next week. During this time, the rise of public cinema took over our imaginations and our Halloween costumes. We saw an increase of fictional characters from westerns and science fiction stories. This also led to a resurgence of cultural appropriation that was heavily present in early Halloween costuming. Again, this shows what dominant culture found acceptable at the time. In the 80s and 90s, we probably had the most iconic of all Halloween costumes, at least in my opinion, the sheet tunic. With light suits that would tie in the back, depict a character on the chest, and have a sharp string-style plastic mask. During this time, we also had the rise of the slasher horror film, aimed at teenagers, and even the most feared monsters of the time, Freddy, Jason, Chucky, and others made for great costumes and a great excuse to carry around a weapon covered in fake blood. Even for scared little spooks like myself, I remember the way the red food dyed corn syrup glistened on the tinfoil I used to make my fake knife look shiny. At 3.6 
billion dollars in 2022, costumes only beat candy by half a billion. With a little less than half of that being spent on the trick-or-treating population, we can see that adults really get into the costume aspect of this holiday as well. So that's all for this week's History of Halloween. But remember, a culture is not a costume, a sexy costume is not a consent to be touched, and there are many ways to be fun, funny, scary, and expressive on Halloween. But always be safe, and be prepared for the weather. You're watching 